All right, so my name is Daniel Trago. I work here at Michigan State University. I teach Spanish and I do a lot of technology stuff um, here within languages and at the, the college level. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about the flipped classroom. Has everyone heard of the flipped classroom at least yes. at some point in time? It's kind of a buzzword that came out of it was actually a while ago. Um, so we're going to take a little closer look at it, um, what it really means to flip a classroom. I'll show you a couple things that we've done with some of our Spanish classes here at MSU. And uh, we'll have a good time. So today we're going to take, here are the goals. We're going to briefly look at the difference between a flipped versus a traditional class or a non-flipped class. Uh, we'll take a look at some of the benefits and some of the challenges to flipping a class. There are lots of challenges, but also lots of benefits. I'll show you a couple activities that we've done, and then we'll give you guys a little bit of time uh, to look in your own context to see what you guys can do. To flip? To flip, right? <laughs> We're all going to learn how to flip also. Although maybe we should have had this presentation before lunch. <laughs> All right, so, late, late, there we go. <laughs> so, first things first, and I always say this anytime we're talking about technology and pedagogy in the same presentation, technology does not make your class better. Yay. Period, right? Everyone's like, all right, put in technology and all of a sudden things are good to go. That is not the case. You make your class better, right? And so I am a big proponent of saying that technology can actually make your class a lot worse if you're not using it correctly, right? So putting bad materials online does not automatically make them better. It actually tends to make them kind of worse. Right? Um, so if I'm doing something in class and it's not going well, one of the good things is because we're all here together, I can change, I can adapt. When I put something online, it's kind of an artifact. Um, and so if there's a problem with the activity and students get there and I'm not there to help out, they come to class the next day and they let me know, right? Hey, this didn't work. Um, lots of things break down. So, Always, always, as we're talking about this, we make our class, classes better, not technology. Um, second things first, I got a few things, we just all need to be on the same page. Flipped and technology are not synonymous. So you can flip a classroom without using any sort of technology. Right? You can simply say, hey, I want you guys to read something in this book before you come. That is technically flipping a class. What we're going to look at is the, the ideas behind there. Also, very common when people think of the flipped classroom, they're like, oh yeah, you watch videos and then you come to class. This isn't always the case. So flipped and video are also not synonymous. However, usually they're all hand in hand. They're very complementary, so we're going to look at that. But they're not always together. And last things, today I might be showing something that seems like we can't even obtain it. Like how could we ever get to this spot? So the, the purpose of this presentation isn't to overwhelm you. Here's a very an environment where we can, can control most of the variables. We have a lot. Uh, we have a context where we can work really easily. You might be thinking, I could never do that. Maybe my administration, maybe my students, maybe my limitations. Um, so it's up to you to take parts of this and implement them. It's good to just make small changes too. So you don't have to go all the way in. All right, so very quickly, let's see. Yes. Just take one second with someone next to you. What, how can we define the traditional classroom? Sorry. So what happens in the classroom? How do we define that? Is it a space? I'll give you guys one minute. 
after lunch conversation. So what do we know about the traditional classroom? I don't have a lot of experience with that. Yeah. It's more yeah. having to get what they like to incorporate a lot of experience technology. So, <coughs> yeah. Yeah, what's traditional? Yeah, exactly. I don't know. But maybe traditional is what I mean. I have been in a long time. When I think of like a traditional class, I think of like, like a stiffy, like a document structure, like you come to class and it's all just like conversation and there's no real stuff that would be like yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so when I say the traditional classroom, what are some of the elements present? Teacher center. Lecture based. Lecture based. Grammar oriented. Grammar oriented. Wow, we're skipping all the way ahead. <laughs> Teacher centered again. Interaction. Interaction. <clears throat> grades. Grades. Oh no, not grades. Far yeah. from the student reality, real use of the language. Okay, so kind of <clears throat> one way traffic. You know? <laughs> one way traffic. So here's a context which we're going to use this language, and nowhere else in your life do you have a similar context. Yes. So let's make this work, right? <laughs> make the best of it. All right, so I have, and this isn't language-centered yet. This is still a little bit more broad. So I have the sacred space, right, where learning happens, or where it's supposed to happen, at least. We're trying, right? <laughs> so a typical framework, um, these kind of get moved all around. But generally what happens, there's a presentation of ideas, however we want to talk about that. We'll practice it. The next class, we'll come back, review it, present some new stuff, practice it, and we kind of get into this. The traditional, when we think about classroom, you kind of have this review, practice, present, and repeat. Um, traditional homework, uh, we won't have to talk. I'll just put this up here. So to reinforce and test the student to see if they retained everything learned in the class, right? So traditionally, I present something. If we have this teacher-centered model, I give you something, and then it's your job then to go home and try it, practice this on your own, reinforce this. Um, some of the problems with homework, and this is especially true, especially true in language acquisition, is there's very delayed feedback, right? So, say I learn something in class, I go home, I do my homework. I come to class the next day, or maybe it's two days away, depending on how your classes are set up. I turn it in, maybe we look at it in class, or maybe the teacher just takes it and then grades it. And so then that's another day or two. So I've done an exercise, and now all of a sudden, four or five days later, I get some feedback on that. Is that useful in the acquisition process, I mean, really? Um, it's really hard. The, the delay on feedback presents a, a, a big um, struggle. Also, um, homework tends not to be interactive student to student. Um, it's really hard. I still fight even here with how do we do group work? How do we do it well? Well, we end up doing it in class because outside <coughs> of class it just doesn't happen as much as we'd like for it to. So the traditional teacher, we, we talked about this teacher-centered in the traditional classroom. We kind of have, does anyone know who this is? Atlas, right? Um, what is his burden? Carry the world, right? So we have this, what's called, and this is really interesting, well, I'll talk about it here in a minute. So they, what they call the Atlas complex, right? And we as teachers sometimes have this complex where we're the ones who have all the answers, we have the knowledge, we're the experts, we're the sage, the leader, the authority, the student's eyes, maybe the dictator of the classroom. Um, they mix that with Sisyphus. 
Sisyphus, you mix that with Sisyphus, and that's us. Oh, okay, so. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so, the purpose of this traditional classroom is to get everything that's in here from me to the student, right? So this is what we're trying to do. Um, in a traditional classroom, in a traditional teacher, um, and it sometimes depends on, on levels too. This is more pertinent maybe in secondary or high school than it is when you get to the university. But, but teachers tend to take on the responsibility. Like if students aren't learning, then there's something that I'm doing that's incorrect. Um, we get into this, like if I don't show a student every single form of a verb, how are they going to know it? That it's my job to do this. Um, and if I don't, then the students aren't set up for success. Um, teachers then generally direct all the aspects of the classroom. Traditional student. The, uh, obviously, we're kind of being a tiny bit flippant here. Um, is the recipient, the follower, the sponge, the needy. There's a very, I think we talked about this traffic, this one way. Stuff's going from me to them, and it's their responsibility to complete all the work, follow all the rules, learning. We tend to see now they really just care about the grade more than they do about learning, right? That's, that's a real struggle we have. Um, so, in the traditional classroom, we have these traditional roles, and generally what happens is that teachers assume too much responsibility. And students then <laughs> assume too little responsibility, right? I mean, I still get like, hey, can you tell me how many absences I have, even though it's online every day. I update it, they can see this. It's still somehow my responsibility to let them know um, how this happened. So the flipped classroom, um, it actually started, it was outside of language teaching um, in Colorado, um, a high school science teacher, I think it was. It was the first one to kind of put the flipped classroom, the title on that. I think there have been ideas of this um, coming. But here, um, so what we have is we've got the in-class space, and then we have out of class. Um, so here, the timing of the homework is a little bit different. So in a traditional class, I'll present something here, all these ideas, and then you'll go home and reinforce that after the presentation. So what happens in the flipped classroom is students prepare to participate before coming to class. So one of the shifts is that the reinforcing of the ideas, instead of happening outside of the classroom, is now happening inside the classroom. Um, so here we have students practice applying key concepts, what we really like, with feedback. Right? And then after class, again, there's more synthesis of learning, kind of expanding on those ideas. Um, so in the flipped classroom, the idea is that the classroom space, that sacred space we identified, is no longer the sole source of learning. And this is kind of a paradigm shift, right? That it's not that you come to class to learn to get the information. Um, that really the classroom becomes then this active space where you're engaging. And obviously for language learning, this is really good. Students can work on interaction, we can engage and then participate. So flipped homework, the students are preparing for that interaction in class. Um, and I'm going to give you guys some examples here. Um, this is all a little bit theoretical. I've given this workshop a couple times before. I've done an all-day workshop on this, where I sent all of this, these slides, out ahead of time and put them on a website. And said, hey, you guys do this before you come because in a way, it's kind of a waste of time, right? You guys can read this and all come in. Why do I have to present this to you? What happens then? 
<laughs> well, not, so not nobody. You have like three people who have done it and then the rest of the people who haven't, right? And we're going to talk about that um, here in a minute. How do we deal with that as teachers, right? There's a big shift. Um, and when we started flipping our classrooms here at MSU, it takes a couple of weeks to really get into the groove of that. And the first couple of weeks are really, really hard, but we've got to stick with it. Um, so to flick homework, um, we're going to get into um, how students can work individually. Um, so really quickly, if we kind of have this before, you know, the sage, the, the sole source of knowledge. The flip teacher, they tend to talk about them more as a partner or a guide or a resource for the learner. Um, and now, instead of being responsible for learning, the teacher is responsible for access to learning. So creating the conditions in which learning can happen. Um, and then, obviously, a big part of this is facilitating interaction. Now the students take on a more active role in their responsibility for learning. So normally, flip classroom, it's like, oh yeah, put some lectures on videos, make students watch them before they come, we flip the class, great. But it has nothing to do with the videos or online, it's really a shift in responsibility, is what really is happening at the heart of a flipped classroom. So I think, yeah, it's easy, here we go. So we prepare explanations beforehand, and we do lots of class activities and practice. Students are now responsible for everything, so we're off the hook, so we're good to go, right? It's just that easy? How many of you guys have some sort of flipped element in your current classes? At least partly. Um, anyone have nothing Obviously, we're kind of working on this partnership. We've got a lot of online stuff. Um, so what we're going to do here really quickly, and I'm going to have you guys. So some of the benefits are students theoretically have more individualized attention. They have more access to learning. This teacher, there are a lot of benefits, too. Um, our responsibility shifts. Um, so quickly, among your find a friend or two friends, and talk about a couple of the challenges. We kind of already mentioned what happens yeah, when no one does yeah, anything, and we're going to talk about that. Um, but what other challenges might there be? So quickly, and we'll come back and talk about that. So what sort of challenges do we have? So say I'm a teacher, and I want to implement this flip thing. I'm going to put some things so students have access before coming class. They're all going to be... 100% prepared, we're going to do these great interactive activities in class, everyone's going to learn, it's going to be great. But it doesn't go that way. <laughs> it doesn't work that way? <laughs> <laughs> well, why not? Because, you know, some students, they misunderstood. You know, that, that. Okay, so like students like might miss understand might know so maybe in the directions even in the kind of like the meta classroom you know what i think they are so used to the traditional way that doesn't you know they don't get it right, right. like uh, we ask them to read this and come prepared read this before and in class we're going to discuss they read five minutes they're skimming over the very simple i mean it's uh, another sure. discussion is not really you it's Okay, so the students don't really put in enough to be able to do what we're doing in class. But even if they do, what if they don't get it? Right, so what if they don't get it? And it's, well, it's not even not putting it. It's not even not putting enough, it's learning how to learn that way. That way, which it's, right. it's not even like, oh, I'm lazy. It's really like, <laughs> should I read it 10 times? Should I go and find parallel text that explain me that in another way because that's not working for me. Right. Identify the problem is, you know, you know I mean, uh, right. we, we are doing workshops to learn how to teach like that, and there are no workshops for them to learn how to teach. So we need some workshops for the students to go to that. I also find that, uh, you know, we have to look at the entire learning, you know, context of the entire institution. So for example, 
the students, they, they come to our language classes, that is maybe perhaps one twentieth of their entire curriculum. So in the other parts, the class, those classes are not flipped. Right. So make, for them to make, so in physics class, the professor is still the sage and the philosopher and carrying the whole right. burden. Yeah. So what happens is this kind of, is, this becomes an issue actually. They think why we are doing this something in a very different, you know, way. It becomes that a cultural so culture, problem, yeah, right? exactly. Within yeah. one institution, right. Mm -hmm. So actually I tend to follow and try to find out what my other colleagues, other subjects are doing. And I try not to deviate too much from their kind of methodology and see, you know, because it's, it comes as a culture shock to them. It does well, come as a culture shock. It's also connected to what you mm -hmm. said, but yeah. like most it's of the time. times our languages are not, yeah, I know. they're I majors mean, or minors. Right, that's so what I said. It's one part of their life. Right, yeah. yeah. So that this is what I'm going for exactly. life. This is my yeah. fun. Right. My yeah. hobby. Yeah. Yeah. Right, exactly. So, so the time then gets yeah. by fast. I want a good grade. Yeah. yeah. I want a great grade, right? Yeah. What do I have to do to get this grade? I love that question. My favorite. It's required. In Spanish, so I know everyone kind of looks at like, oh, what are people doing in the languages that get taught all the time? And they've even had, oh, so it's got to be easier teaching Spanish, right? And I would almost argue that sometimes it's harder. I mean, on the one hand, yes, we might have more resources. But on the other hand, we also get more of the students that are not self-selecting. So if a student says, oh, I have a requirement to graduate, and I have to take a language, first thing, well, what's the easiest language? Yeah. Uh, Spanish, that's an easier language than all the others, right? We can talk about that another day. Um, so that's actually one of the biggest, the majority, so our 100 and 200 level, um, I have to go back and look at the stats, but we once wanted to see how many actually go on to become majors and minors, and it's like 10%. Like, so if we have 1,000 students a semester, 100 maybe? But out of a thousand, <laughs> that's a big group that are only going to be here for a couple of semesters and go away. Not really interested in learning language. They're here because it's a requirement. So. And even if they were on top of all the things that they said, even if they are, there is no time. If you have a typical athlete wakes up at five, their time is dictated all through the way. And we work for the big 10 schools. The kids are exhausted by the time they start doing your extra work. Yeah. They are barely have time to even meet with their tutor. And so then you say, oh, I really want you to learn on your own. And then you're saying, you're competing with a major. They're struggling with a major. Yeah. Yeah. So realistically, are we talking about kids at Harvard? <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm not trying yeah, to, like, no, who, no, no. who's saying, I, this I, is I, all I, my I life is going to, or are we saying, we really want you to learn, get something out of this without giving you busy stuff? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the one thing I discussed with one one time too is even though the, the, our students are different because we have some state schools where the students are barely making, the parents cannot help much, so they have to take on jobs. So I have exactly. to do the free jobs. Yeah. Well, it's completely different from our student there at, at the University of Chicago, where it's a private school, the students solely study. It's yeah. their goal. So even within the university, we have that change. Yes, yeah, so that, that is a very, and I don't know if this is technically the flipped classroom presentation, but, but, it is in a, but it is in a way if we're looking at this traditional, especially in language. So one thing we did here at Michigan State is we looked at our, we used to have a traditional book for the 100 level, a second book for the 200 level, and we cruise right through the book and the 100 level, cruise right through the book and the 200 level, and we're good. Right, our goals are page numbers on the book, and we've got we got to make sure okay, uh, we hit this feature in the language, this one, this one, this one, and then we're going to spend. If you're familiar with the subjunctive, so we spend years on the subjunctive, right? Less than five percent of spoken speech, but we spend all this time on this, and this is why we did this survey to see how many students are actually going to go on. And we see that hardly any really go all the way through, starting at 101 going into major minor or maybe like two or three students a few of them dip in at just the very end of the 200 and start going in but hardly any so what we did is we looked at our book and said hey we could take our first year book cut it in half 
and then stretch it out over three semesters. So subjunctive, goodbye. Now I know people are going to be like, but you didn't teach them that. How are they going to know? If we look at this flipped classroom model, it's not my responsibility. So you actually did it or you wish? Yeah, we actually did. We did it. We did away with it. We don't teach the subjunctive in the 100 and 200 level at all anymore. And for those of you who know, that used to be probably 60% of the curriculum within the 100 and 200 level. How do they read? Huh? They can still read. Mm -hmm. Subjunctive is also not usually uh, meaning bearing. So those are features that students don't pick up for years and years and years. Why do we have to force that in year one? So what happens is, and I've seen this so many times, I have, having taught at a bunch of different levels, I, we teach the present tense and some of the past tense in the first year, and then we spend like a whole year on the subjunctive. And then they get to the 300 level where they're starting to become majors and minors, and I'm here teaching, and everyone's trying to tell me stories in the present tense, and all that's coming out of their mouth is the subjunctive. <laughs> I mean, period. It, it's because you learn something, but we have to learn so much more that we don't reinforce that forever. So we said, hey, looking at the actual standards, where does the subjunctive even come in? It's superior. It's, yeah, we're talking superior. So why do they have to be able to do that? In the second year of language study, when they've had maybe 50, 60 hours of contact with a language, it's not even, even a native child growing up isn't going to get the subjunctive until eight, nine, ten years, even in, in embedded clauses. So we made a goal that uh, 50% of our, I think 50% of students leaving 202, which is the intermediate, would be at the intermediate mid level. Intermediate mid level isn't even being able to narrate in different time frames. And that's actually a really high goal. You guys know how high these are. So we did some stuff where we flipped and said, hey, there's no way we can get to all this. And it's not even fair because if students are gonna spend two years with us, I'd rather they be able to have a conversation with someone rather than know all of these features about Spanish. It's a lot more important. It's something they can actually use outside of this classroom. I know, this is, I'm getting way off topic here, but. <laughs> so, so, let me, so, so do we agree that even if you want to put our students in the driver, driver's seat, you know, and take charge of their learning, self-learning, much more than they're used to. I mean, we feel, we tend to feel frustrated, you know. That we, we tend to feel frustrated, but then what we did is, hey, let's actually set them up to be successful. Instead of just set this high, high bar. Let's take the bar way further down than we'd ever feel comfortable doing and see what happens. And we're finding some positive results. So challenges, I'm just going to look at these. We're going to do an activity so that we can have fun today too, right? Um, so we obviously have technical restrictions, so access, familiarity, we tend to assume that students know how to use technology. And I use technology very broadly. They know how to use the technology they're familiar with, but not the stuff they're not familiar with. This kind of goes the same for us too. Um, what kind of support is in? We have economical, which can be a time thing, and also monetary, right? So, oh, I found this great program, but we have to subscribe to it, or we have to do this. Um, pedagogical, again, not the purpose of this, but are we working on communicative learning? Are we, is acquisition at the forefront? Or is this learning about language? Um, is it a goal-oriented? Motivational, this is really just something you have to do and it's really hard. So one time I did this presentation and I put everything online in the beginning. This is what a traditional classroom, this is a flipped. And we came in and I just started doing exercises. And everyone kind of flipped out, except for the like five people who really read ahead. And you can't do this, you have to go back. And I, I made this a point of saying, if you do this in your classroom, you cannot go back over that. And it's a week or two of really hard, 
if students know that you're just going to go back over something as soon as you get into class, there's no motivation to do it. We wouldn't do it, right? So what, so what do you do? Because that's, that's something that I struggle with too. Like, um, you know, I, before I even knew what um, flipped classrooms were, I was mm -hmm. doing that already. Right. So using the class time just to practice, to use grammar mm -hmm. in context. And it was, I would assign very little exercise, like three or two exercises on the grammar point that we would be using. But students, especially in the first levels, they're just coming to that, even though it's explained and it's graded and yeah. I assign grade. But they still expect me to go and stop the class and go through grammar points that I'm like, you're going to practice it and you're going to yeah. pick up even if you didn't, even if, you, you know, like in the first semester. Yeah. But um, I had sometimes like noticed that everybody was like, oh, and I was okay. So you just have to spend the first couple of weeks and hang them out to dry. <laughs> just <laughs> let I'm serious. Just you're gonna fail until you figure out how this is working. They usually do. Right? So they'll figure it out. It's the same thing. Even if I say something in Spanish, and I get in the habit of, oh, I see people don't understand, so I'm just gonna say it in English. So what happens to students? when they're listening to me. They don't listen for a word in Spanish anymore. They're just waiting for the English explanation. If I sit here and look confused, I can trick him. Right? This is, this is what they do. This is what happens. And it's not a malicious thing, right? It's the easier way to communicate. Yeah, there's, there, there's nothing wrong with this, which is kind of why it's hard to combat. But again, Who's laughing at me when he knows it's true? <laughs> <laughs> All right. I like it. So what's the use in trying, right? I guess that's the whole thing. So what happens when students don't change? Or what happens if I can't change? And those are two things. As we really think through this, you kind of have to go out on a limb and try some new stuff. So what I'm going to do here, um, I'm going to show you something that we do. All right, so we have this... Uh, has so anybody ever seen uh, <laughs> Curious Case of Benjamin Button? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who like ages backwards. Yeah. Like he's born old and then he gets younger. Good movie. Um, so we have this activity. Um, I'm going to walk you through it. This is like the only group that I have the less commonly taught language. Yeah. So this is great. <laughs> it's Spanish. So um, what I'm going to do is have you guys, this is an activity that we do in class. So we're going to do it. And then we're going to walk backwards and see what we did to get students here to be able to do this. Okay? And I think it's going to help answer some of our questions, maybe help alleviate some of our frustrations. All right, so what we're going to do is this is in the United States, you guys are going to write down what you think the typical age that certain life events happen. So I'm going to run through them really quickly. Um, first one is when you have your first boyfriend or girlfriend. Like the serious one, right? And just, um, second one, when do uh, we drink beer for the first time? Number three, graduate from the university. Four, get married. And some of these are in English here. I lost them for you. Um, have our first child, have grandchildren, retire. And then eight is the life expectancy. How long do we live? So take one minute, put what you think the typical ages in the United States are. All right, after you've done Paso Uno here, so uh, you put what you think the typical age is, then you interview someone else, and we're going to do this kind of speedily. Um, so you're going to, what we would do in Spanish, you're asking them, hey, what do you think? And then you write their answer, and then you put if you are in the same ballpark or not, right? So if you guys are in agreement. So you write down what your partner says in the second part. Okay! So what happens when students come to Spanish class? We'll have like a quick warm up and this is actually our entire day. Our entire day together. Entire day? Well, our entire hour. So we have a three, three, we meet, we have a four credit class that meets for three hours a week. One hour is online, um, which is the flipped, yeah, the hybrid. We call it technology enhanced here because we have to have a percentage of class that's online before it can be called hybrid, but that's neither here nor there. 
So, students roll in being able to do this. This is in a 101 classroom. In our context here, 100% Spanish in the classroom. No English. We do have, some of these things are glossed in English, and we actually have these glosses in our class because these, there are a couple things in here that students don't have yet. Um, and in what we know, especially in the very early classes, it's hard to do anything interesting because the students just don't have the language for it. So we're saying, hey, you can have a few words here. We're not going to worry about them. We're concentrating on some other things. So just in, so that we can have an interesting activity here. Um, so what I would do then as a teacher, I'd say, all right, guys, what do you have? Um, first boyfriend or girlfriend, what age? 14, 16, 17, 17, okay, fairly similar. Drink beer for the first time? 16, 17, 18, 18, 18 21, 19. right? <laughs> <laughs> they all fight me on that. 14, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16. graduate from the university? 22, 22 23, 20, 24, 24, 24, 24, 24. <laughs> To get married. 35. Have our first child. 30. 30. 30. So then we talk about all these grandchildren retired. So then what we do is we take a look at what the statistics are from the United States and culturally we're comparing ourselves in this one here um, to what's typical in Spain, for example. Um, so first boyfriend and girlfriend, so now you're like, ooh, are we are we close? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we're all excited, right? In Spain, what might you think? <laughs> first beer. Sadly is not twenty-one, it is fourteen. Oh wow. In Spain? <laughs> so we're doing all these things. Graduate from the university. We've got twenty-two in Spain. Twenty-three. And this then draws out a little bit longer in the European system, especially in Spain. To get married. 25, 26. 26. Oh. In Spain? Yeah. 30. 33. Okay. Um, first child? 25. Does anyone notice a trend? We get married at 26. We have a child at 25. Might have the cart before the horse. Um, in Spain? 35. All right, so we're stretching things out. Um, and we just pulled these off uh, Google. We looked at the statistics. Um, grandchildren? 52. 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, so we notice they graduate later, they get married later, they have kids later. They're right off the mark. Right? Life expectancy, this is an average of men and women. You can obviously, in a class, you can, there's so many things you can tease out here. We're going super fast. 80. In Spain? So we can start making all kinds of connections depending on the level. We're in a 101 class. I might try to tie a couple things in. They get the marriage, but I can't give these really long things. Like, oh, hey, everything is really late in life. 
except for retiring, and then they live longer. That's kind of strange, right? I mean, so all kinds of connections you can make. I talk about myself. I got married when I was 20. So I'm like, oh, well, you're not normal. <laughs> and now, how old am I? I'm 34 now, and I don't have any kids. So I don't fit any of the molds. So we talk about all these things. It's a great way to do this. We spend tons of class time. All right, so how did we get here? What do we need to know to complete this task? Numbers. Numbers. Family, vocabulary. Family, vocabulary, basic vocabulary, maybe something more specific. I mean, general trends in the culture. So, I think that so yeah, general trends in the culture, but we're actually kind of banking on that being knowledge that they're bringing to class. That's not something I have to teach them, which is really good because we're using knowledge that they already have. So then the language part is easier, right? Their processing powers aren't being <coughs> zapped by something else because this yeah. is stuff they already have. Uh, and that's the great stuff because rather than you know going yep. from language to language, they're coming from culture to language. Culture and language. So this is also kind of flipping, you know. Yeah. Verb <laughs> to be, like that. Yeah. So we've got to be. Obviously, we've got <laughs> tango. So here, like, <laughs> how many Some years phenomenal you are? verbs. Huh? Some phenomenal verbs. They're in here, but we're not going to focus on them. Again, this is one. Of, this is maybe week four or five in 101, so nothing with pronouns. Also, there's more uh, uh, the interaction like in terms of agreement. Right. So we have this like estoy de acuerdo. Oh, yeah. estoy de acuerdo. That's something we're kind of getting then because yeah. that's going to be really useful in class. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For lots and yeah, so just for them to be able to respond without having to create big things as well. Walk up with the life events. Mm -hmm. So the life events, and again, we lost some of them. So what we have here is we like to always have two goals in mind. So one we have what we call a communicative goal. So there's something that they're, there's meaning behind this. I'm not just practicing Spanish here. Here we're trying to arrive at a conclusion. Hey, what age are these life events typical in the United States? Are we different than other countries? Do we as a class agree? You know, some people say, oh, it's this. Other people say, no, that can't be right. So we can look at so many more countries and different things. And this activity really came about because we had the dreaded numbers 30 to 100 in the textbook, right? What do we do with that normally? Bingo. Bingo. <laughs> Other than bingo? I mean, the calendar's out now. That's how we get up to 30. With the larger numbers, sometimes I get blank checks so they can fill out. A blank check, but then they want really big numbers, right? <laughs> That's what I Time? Up to 60 times. Yeah. So I asked them uh, if they have grandparents who are still alive and uh, how old they are. So we do kind of competition as the oldest yeah. grandparents. Yeah, so we can talk, and that's yeah. obviously what we tie in with that. Okay, whose parents are this old? Yeah. Or, okay, you're supposed to get married at this age. You guys are close, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> All of these different things. So we thought, hey, how can we make numbers one, or numbers 30 through 100 fun? How many numbers do we just throw around the room? A ton, right? How many of you were really focused on the numbers? It's more like my idea. You're wrong. I'm right. It has to be this, or this is what I think. Students kind of lose the fact that they're learning Spanish with activities like this. Are they supposed to write down the numbers, or they just just write the numbers? We just yeah. have them jot. Some people are like, you have to have them write out the numbers, but I don't know. I guess I'm a proponent that they're not usually written out that much. Well, sometimes by doing that, it may sound artificial. Mm -hmm. right. Sometimes when we do certain things, like don't spell it out. I leave a blank. You put in. Some people will write them out because mm -hmm. they want to practice them. Mm -hmm. Some people don't, and I'm not. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, 
from 1 to 30, so you taught before. We've already done 1 through 30 a couple so, weeks okay. ago, so we're, we're building on things okay. that we've already done. And obviously there's a little bit of review too, right? Mm -hmm. So, the right, right, yeah. 18 so we want to give, again, some success in the beginning. Oh yeah, I have to remember what we did a couple weeks ago, and now I'm going to be on that. Just a quick question, did they acquire the vocabulary and the numbers needed outside of the classroom, or was it in class? Yep, um, the vocabulary here, some of it is in class, especially the gloss stuff. But the numbers, I'll show you guys, this is what we have them do before class. Um, we didn't create videos, we didn't do... Because in the traditional class, I'd be like, okay, class, 31. Oh yeah, okay, we're learning this. What a waste of our time, right? Again, we, we also said one of the challenges for the flipped classroom is what if student needs more time on something? And we're saying if we give it to them in a context where they can spend all the time that they need, that's better than in class, right? Because traditionally in class, we weren't giving students what they need. We tend to kind of teach towards that upper group. So there's always varying levels in our classes. Sometimes we try to help the ones at the bottom. Sometimes we help the ones at the top. Usually kind of that upper middle is where we tend to fall in. But here, so we told them their, their um, homework was said, hey, go to this online page in your book. Click on all the numbers four or five times and become familiar with them. So they can go over here. If I can find my mouse. They can click. Mm -hmm. Yay, I don't have to do it. And what if one student only needs to hear it once? Okay, they can keep going. If another student needs it ten times, they can sit there and annoy all of their sweet guys. Okay. Right? So going through this, so we give them this tool just to become familiar. And then what we do are we have activities that we created here in-house, and we decided to go, there's always, you have to assess kind of the time it takes to create something, the life expectancy of something you create too. One of the great things about having online flip materials are, I'm going to spend all this time one year and create them, but they're going to serve me for a number of years down the road where I don't have to do that, mm -hmm. which is a net benefit for us. But we have to think, if I create the activity in such a way that, well, next year it's not relevant anymore, it's a disservice. Video is, tends to have a shorter life expectancy than audio. Audio has less problems across mm -hmm. devices and browsers. Mm -hmm. We wanted students to be able to interact with these. Hey, I'm at the bus and I've got 10 minutes. Um, so instead of having one exercise with lots of different files, we broke it up. Each of these have about eight or nine questions. Um, they've got about a half an hour's worth of work. They can spend as much time theoretically as little time as they need to beforehand too. So we've got activities where they... Um, so here, before proceeding with the next set of activities, study the vocabulary on this page. Click on the phrases, become familiar with it. Um, so here they are typing the number they hear. 32. Oh yeah, so now I don't have 32 there right in front of me. The projector doesn't work very well. And so we even tell them here, hey, do it this way, because that whole, oh, it didn't have an accent, or hey, this was capitalized. We want students to have immediate feedback. Immediate, to know they can judge themselves before they get to class if they know it or not, which is a great value to us. So we've got that, there's tons more activities, and we start to get progressively Harder. Again, always, now we're testing their mathematics. 99 menos 77. Oh, wow, now it's getting hard, right? <laughs> so now I have to subtract <coughs> 77 from 99. Oh, no, so I get up my calculator. Okay. But again, this is comprehension-based, right? So now we're jumping past the recognition phase into the comprehension. 
always have meaning. So these are the types of activities that students do. So then when we start throwing these numbers around, oh yeah, I've got these. Obviously 30 through 100 is a lot. One night of preparation isn't going to do it, right? So we help them out. So do you, do you, have, do you create this um, formula that you website, or are you using like something like Bilingual Labs or something like that? Um, this was, we've worked with different publishers. This is um, Kia. I don't know if anyone's uh -huh. ever heard of Kia, which uh -huh. is really good place to make activities. It's not super expensive. Um, all your students can go there. Really easy to do audio. They have tons of different question types. Um, we use that for a long time. We're now on the uh, McGraw Hill platform. Can you spell the name of this website? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's if you go to books.com. Q-U-I-A-Kia.com. So, so um, I'm sorry, do, again, this was already there for Spanish, or you guys created We created, we recorded all of the audio files. Oh, uh, okay, and how, how was this process like? Um, it was a long process because we did, we created everything ourselves. We said we don't want to rely on the textbooks anymore because they didn't really fit our context. Um, so we created them all. We would spend one semester. We wrote all the activities too, um, and we would completely revamp one class, and then every semester we work. Okay, so there's a team about four or five of us. Four or five in one semester of work mm -hmm. to have the website. To do one class, yeah. So one we did, class. one semester we did Spanish 101, the next semester we did Spanish 102, uh -huh. and two of one. Two. What is good feedback? Did, did they like it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's gotten really positive feedback. Um, these are also a big portion of students' grades. Um, we want to talk about motivation. It's like 50% of their grade is there on their pre-class activities. So that's also, we know how to motivate them, right? Yes, we then connect it into our grade. Um, it's automatically graded within here, and then we just transfer at the end of every chapter. Um, I believe they have two attempts, but you can listen to any audio file as many times as you need to. Which for us, the input of that is more important than. Do you have read and means to find out how many times did they practice? We can see the amount of submissions. I can't tell how many times they clicked on it. So I think it depends on each um, per, it's about 20 minutes, three times a week, so it was about an hour. It was what they spent on here, but that's not including what they did in their textbook to prepare so for this. So there's a sort of a companion textbook. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So could you just tell me, I'm just curious, so for these specific activities, so what is uh, the content or the, the goals of that specific Unit. That was numbers 30 to 100. Like oh, this, this, unit. this, yeah, that, that was, we took that out of the textbook and we're like, so uh, we need to make this better. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, let me ask one question. I think, uh, yeah, and I gotta right. get going. Yeah, actually, so he has a podcast. He has to record. Hey guys, so um, it's like a, a live podcast. podcast. Um, so he needs to go because uh, we don't want him to miss that. So, have you guys ever heard of the uh, SLA podcast Tea with BBP? Oh, yeah. Oh. yeah, so um, it's, an, it's a second, Hang on, it's coming up. Yeah, it's coming up. It's a second language acquisition podcast that they do here with Bill Van Patten um, and several other people here, and they record that and it goes live at three o'clock. So he needs to go and set up for that so he can do that. So completely coincidence. The topic for today. Mm -hmm. The Atlas Complex. Oh. <laughs> ah. Very quickly, are you still able to get everybody in the class with the flip, this kind of approach, or still you are catering to the There's apart? still a couple people that have a little bit more struggle, but okay. on the whole, students. Okay. And what yeah. happens is, yeah. one of the big motivations, <laughs> oh, that, was, that was Bill. Students <laughs> see everyone participating in class and having fun. That has, we've seen that to be one of the biggest motivators. When all their peers are participating and really engaging in something that's fun and interesting and interactive in class, that is a huge motivation that we don't normally think about. Um, it's 
kind of untapped. So yeah, we get them at the grade level. We try to make it fun. But then also, they have that peer pressure too. If they don't prepare before coming to class and everyone else is like doing stuff and they're just sitting there, that, uh, you go back home differently after that. <laughs> Daniel, yeah. one question, last question. Yeah. Is there a empirical support for the effectiveness of this type of instruction delivery? In terms of? The SLA research, for example. Um, well, one thing we did, oh, I got to go. But <laughs> we did away with all tests in class. We did a study where we gave half the classes in-class tests. The other half, we put the tests online. Mm. Didn't call them tests actually gave them multiple attempts on the activity, so they look just like their online activities, but we said, hey, we call them synthesis activities. <laughs> we gave them at the end, we're like, hey, this is, try this without your book, see how well you do. Mm -hmm. Statistically, zero difference in performance. Mm. So what do we do? Doing class testing? It's gone, it's now all online. So they don't think they have tests, but they do. <laughs> Thank you. But it was really cool. So, yeah, one thing.